Uh, hello and welcome to this week's Tales of the Resistance. This is a podcast all about antimicrobial resistance and how this growing health crisis can affect our daily lives. Um, I'm Mara Zelt. I am the project manager with the I Am Responsible Project, um, one of the regular hosts of this series. This week's episode is coming to us from uh, the class that we teach called Antimicrobial Resistance from a One Health Perspective. Uh, today's discussion comes from the lecture, a lecture from Dr. Jennifer Granick from the University of Minnesota. Um, I've included um, my own voice asking some questions where audio wasn't clear. Um, and this is discussion about how antimicrobial resistance impacts veterinary medicine for companion animal care. So we'll go ahead and take you there. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Granick. Uh, she is an associate professor at the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine. Um, she's uh, in the small. She's a small animal internal medicine um, assistant professor. She received her DVM from the University of Wisconsin and then completed her small animal internal medicine residency at the University of Minnesota and became boarded in that specialty in 2008. She also has a PhD in comparative pathology from the University of California, Davis. Uh, she has a really active research program right now that focuses on um, clinical antibiotic use and antimicrobial stewardship um, with a focus on small animal veterinary medicine. Um, and as a clinician in the veterinary hospital and as a teacher, she primarily focuses on infectious diseases, including zoonotic diseases. So we talked about those that transfer between humans and animals, and then also antimicrobial stewardship. Okay, thanks for that introduction. I hope that we can have a, a good conversation. Well, we're so happy that you were able to come and join us today uh, for this discussion as well. Um, we've got lots of questions already from students will go ahead and start going through those. How do you perceive the issue of antimicrobial resistance uh, as it relates to veterinary medicine, but within a larger public health context? So this is a One Health, health Forum. And so as you all know, at this point, antimicrobial resistance is a, a One Health issue. The concern is that and microbial resistant infections are increasing. And there are some estimates that by 2050, untreatable infections are going to be the major cause of death worldwide, surpassing um, that of cancers. When, when antimicrobials came on the scene, they really changed things. Uh, you know, infections that people used to die from are, you know, all of a sudden became treatable. And um, anyone that works in medicine, regardless of what sector, you know, uses these as a common tool to help our patients. The trouble is that all antimicrobial use leads to the development of antimicrobial resistant organisms. They are trying to survive just like every other organism on earth and so develop methods that they can use to not be killed by antimicrobials. Some of those are inherent, but some of those are um, developed with that pressure that antimicrobial use provides. Because of this, then judicious use of antimicrobials is required to slow the emergence of resistant infections and maintain the efficacy of the antimicrobials that we need to keep patients healthy. So because this is a One Health issue, um, we have to think about it holistically. So the use of antibiotics, regardless of what sector they're used in, contribute to resistance and has effects on other sectors. So antimicrobial use in people affects the use of antimicrobials in animals. Antimicrobial use in animals affects that in people, and they both affect um, the environment. So the development of, of resistant organisms is really complex. And um, Exposure to resistant bacteria or genes is not limited to just one sector. There are reservoirs of antimicrobial resistance, whether they're in people or in humans, and particularly in companion animals, there can be mixing because of the close association of those populations. One estimate in 2019, 2020 was that 67% of all US households had a pet in it. 
Um, and pets often receive medically important antimicrobials. So some of the same drugs or the same drug classes that are used for um, infection control in people, we use those same drugs in animals. So the other concern is that there's potential spread of antimicrobial resistant organisms between pets and people. Um, and that's particularly true um, when we're talking about bacteria that's present on the skin or present in saliva, if you think about the way you interact with your, with your household pets, you know this to be true, um, that, you, that you know, there's a lot of contact, and at least my Labrador retriever likes to lick a lot. <laughs> um, there was one study that showed that having a dog in the household increases the bacterial diversity of adult skin. So if there were two adult humans living in a household, they shared less of their um, skin microbiome than if you added a pet to that mix. So that pet kind of helped with the mixing and diversity um, and sharing of microbes between the people, which, which suggests that people and animals uh, are mixing and sharing microbes as well. What do we know about the current level of antimicrobial resistance in companion animals? In the United States, we have not had any mechanism thus far for large scale surveillance. Um, there, there are definitely ongoing efforts um, to look at antimicrobial resistance um, in, in veterinary laboratory, um, referral laboratory settings where they're, they're monitoring these things. Um, and right now, there's not a mechanism for um, large scale um, monitoring of antimicrobial use in companion animals. And so in the UK, um, up to 25% of E. coli isolates of the urinary tract in cats and dogs were resistant to all antibiotics. So, um, and the reason why I chose that, there are certainly more countries, but because we know that the way that we practice medicine um, in companion animals is really similar in UK compared to um, settings in the United States. And so it's very likely that if we were to look at resistant infections, resistant um, bacterial infections of the urinary tract in cats and dogs in the United States, I would expect that we would probably have a similar figure. So what this means is that you know, maybe only half of urinary tract infections that are treated in cats and dogs in settings like the, the UK are susceptible to the drugs that we normally use to treat those infections. And what do we know about the current prescribing practices in, in companion animal care um, in the US or, or around the world? In the United States, we have some smaller studies, um, um, single center studies and some multi-center studies looking at um, antimicrobial use. But what we really need is um, a, you know, a way to look at what we're doing as a profession nationally. And that's something that we're working on, looking at a couple of different mechanisms that we can use to actually monitor antimicrobial use in companion animal veterinary settings. So one is sort of low tech manual collection using a point prevalence survey. So on one day and time, multiple clinics will collect antibiotic use data in their practice. And then when we combine all of that data together, we get a really good estimate of the prevalence of antimicrobial use in companion animals. And um, not only what drugs are being used, but, but for what indications. This is useful because as we progress with stewardship in our profession, we'll be able to say, we have these benchmarks, you know, this is where we started, where, um, and then we can compare that, you know, down the road. So these types of things can be repeated um, in time. The other really important part about collecting antimicrobial use data is to identify areas where maybe there's a lot of prescribing and then examine that and determine, you know, is this appropriate prescribing and are these areas that veterinarians need more support? And the other major um, initiative that we're working on is something called the Companion Animal Veterinary Surveillance Network, which instead of manual um, collection of data, this is uh, passive on the part of the practices that are um, participating, where, um, you know, we work on our end sort of with the high tech stuff, right, of um, pulling electronic health record data, analyzing that and collating it. Um, but the veterinary practices that are involved really don't have to do anything but say, yes, we want to participate. What do you perceive as the major barriers to stewardship 
uh, to improving stewardship practices in veterinary medicine. So there are specific barriers to antimicrobial stewardship in veterinary medicine, particularly companion animal medicine. Um, and one of those is that even though we, I mentioned that we do have some evidence-based guidelines, um, they're, they're ultimately pretty lacking in veterinary medicine. Um, there's still a whole lot of question marks as far as what is the best way to intervene with treatment for specific diseases. Um, duration of drug use is a big question mark um, that we need to address because we know the longer that we pressure bacteria with an antimicrobial, the more likely that bacteria is to escape the effects and develop a re resistance. There's also um, this uh, idea that if I'm not seeing this directly in my practice, then it's not my problem. Um, and so this is the idea of kind of pointing the finger, finger elsewhere instead of looking inward and saying like, what can I do to make sure that this, um, that, you know, I'm, I'm contributing to a solution. It's really easy unless you're confronted with a problem to sort of push it off. Um, and so, you know, how do we change sort of the hearts and minds of, of all those out there that are prescribing? And then lastly, and I think this is really one of the biggest issues, antibiotic prescribing is often an emotional decision for veterinarians, right? It's a lot about relationships. Sometimes that's based upon, you know, real pressure from the client, but oftentimes it is based upon sort of perceived um perceived pressure. Maybe the, the, the pet owner is not really saying it, but the veterinarian feels like if the pet owner is coming in and paying for an exam, they expect to go home with something that is going to fix their pet. And so there's a lot of pressure for prescribing. So this perception that if, um, if I do nothing, that's worse than, um, than doing something like prescribing an antibiotic. So this sort of false idea that antibiotics are safe and pose little threat to patients, we know that's not true. Um, we know that, you know, certainly there's the risk of antimicrobial resistance, there's the risk of drug toxicity. And as we learn more and more about the, the um, microbiome in pets, we know that antibiotic use can affect sort of the normal flora that lives both inside and outside of our patients and, and how disrupting those might have more far reaching effects. So we actually surveyed veterinarians in Minnesota and we asked them about this. And we said, do you feel uh, that the risk of not treating a patient with antibiotics in the event of diagnostic uncertainty. So if they have a patient and they don't really know what's going on, or maybe there's limitations from the pet owner as far as you know ability to, to pay for diagnostics that would actually allow us to know what was going on, in the absence of, of those knowns, when there's diagnostic uncertainty, um, most veterinarians felt that the use of antibiotics um, was better than not using antibiotics. So the, the risk of using antibiotics outweighed the potential adverse effects. Um, and so most veterinarians in that situation feel compelled to prescribe. You know, this idea that veterinarians feel that if pet owners come in um, because they have a sick pet, that they have to do something active about it. They have to provide something tangible like a prescription for that pet owner to go with home with so that it's clear that they care about their pet and they want to do something to, to, to help. Um, but sometimes antimicrobial prescribing is not only not going to be helpful, but can be harmful. And so um, sometimes you know, not prescribing is the right thing to do. And so we've created a, a non-antibiotic prescription pad that, pro that provides pet owners with positive things that they can do. So what should they expect? What are the things that they can do for their pet at home? Um, when should they call back? And are there any other non-antibiotic things that they can use to intervene? And so this is, um, this is something that they can use that is active, but is not an antimicrobial prescription. And then, um, do you know if there have been any efforts getting started to try to limit the level of antibiotics used for companion animals? We do have some guidelines in companion animal medicine about appropriate use for specific uh, diseases. So for lower urinary tract infections and upper urinary tract infections, for respiratory infections and for skin infections in dogs and cats. And the reason why that's important is that the American Veterinary Medical Association estimated, they did a survey and they estimated that um, inappropriate use of antibiotics in pets is likely 
as um, significant as it is in human health care. So in human health care, depending on the setting, whether it's inpatient or outpatient or long-term care, 30 to 50% of antimicrobial use is inappropriate. And that means that either it's unnecessary, so it's being used in a um, patient that does not have a bacterial infection or does not have a bacterial infection that requires antimicrobial treatment, or there's inappropriate dose, inappropriate duration, or inappropriate choice of antimicrobial. And so it's estimated that that is similar in human medicine and there have been, or sorry, in veterinary medicine, there've been some smaller studies that look at that. I uh, was just wondering if we had any data on, uh, I guess, mixed animal practices that prescribe antibiotics to small animals versus small, solely small animal practices that prescribe antibiotics to small animals, if there was any differences in those. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's an awesome question. Um, and we, we did do a point prevalence survey in practices in Minnesota and North Dakota, um, but our numbers were small. So I don't know that I can like make any um, conclude, I can't draw conclusions about like that comparison. We had, you know, three equine only clinics, three that were mixed and then the um, 16 that were just, or 13 that were small animal only. Um, but what we hope to do with our, our companion animal veterinary surveillance network is to col collect electronic health record data from a variety of um, practices, including mixed and equine only and small animal only. Um, so we might be able to tell you something about that in the future. And I don't know that that's been specifically looked at in a, another methodology. Do you know, Amanda? What do you think the actions we can take as non-veterinarians to help with antimicrobial resistance in companion animals or maybe more generally. So you can do things just like you're doing right now with this seminar series. So become educated about antimicrobial resistance and stewardship. Get involved. So find out what internships or fellowships or um, summer research positions are available. Can you volunteer and help? For example, here in Minnesota, we're always looking for um, volunteers to help sort of with the, the public conversation. So um, when we're not in a pandemic, we go to the Minnesota State Fair and we have folks that are talking to the public um, every day about um, antibiotic use and the importance of um, using drugs appropriately. Um, and then, you know, just be your own advocate for your pet and for yourself when you go to the doctor or the veterinarian, ask them about um, how they approach antibiotic use and, um, and open up that conversation. I'm sure they'd be really happy to talk to you about it. Okay, I think that's probably all the time we have for today. So we'll wrap up here and come back again next week. Thanks for um, joining us and thank you guys. <laughs>